Rich Grant uh, from the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. Um, I deal with a lot of uh, gaseous and, and particulate and uh, biological emissions from farms and uh, talk about the emission that spread and the deposition of those. Today I, I want to focus on uh, gas emissions from open manure storage. And uh, to sort of frame the question, and Frank has already framed it uh, in, in a slightly different uh, slide, is that our primary sources for greenhouse gases on, uh, from farms are, include the feed, emissions from the feed, emissions from the uh, fermentation of the animals, the storage of material in the pits uh, or uh, on the bedding of, of the uh, barns or in the corrals, uh, then open waste storages in, in basins or lagoons and uh, the separated solid storage as well. And then ultimately the spreading of that liquid sludge or uh, solids onto the uh, cropped fields. We're going to focus today really on uh, only two of those or three of those topics. Uh, the the uh, proposed rule covers the three positions that are marked in uh, black or they have black lettering. And uh, so I'll separate out what I'm talking about relative to specifically covered under the rule and that which isn't covered under the rule. Uh, to give a breakdown a little bit on the two, three gases that we're talking about, um, methane, uh, carbon dioxide, and, and nitrous oxide have a bit different characteristics and consequently uh, have different characteristics that we need to consider when we're measuring those gases. Uh, methane has very low solubility in water and you can see from the, uh, uh, you can see the uh, relative solubility of methane in water is about 100 times smaller than that for CO2. So methane typically emits as uh, is produced within the lagoon, then bubbles up through the lagoon. And you can see pictures of these bubbles rising up through the uh, through the anaerobic lagoons. The uh, the Carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide are bo both highly soluble in water, and as a result, emissions from those gases are over the entire surface area of the lagoon or over the uh, entire surface area of uh, uh, any wet area of, of uh, manure. So we have several issues that we need to consider. The, the proposed EPA ruling uh, reported reports only or requires reporting only of the methane and nitrous oxide. It ties the uh, methane computationally to the total volatile solids computed or measured in the manure, and it ties the nitrous oxide emissions to the total nitrogen present in the manure. Uh, if we look at the literature, uh, there's, there's a lot of variability in how we uh, have documented those emissions. Some of, the, uh, some of the reports do it on a per animal basis. Sometimes they do it on a per feed input basis. Sometimes it's reported on a per area basis of the emitting surface. So there's a lot of variability in the literature in terms of these uh, actual emissions uh, measured. Difficulties doing, doing these kinds of measurements is that uh, there is not a standard way to document the farm operations or the source characteristics or the meteorological conditions under which the measurements were made. Consequently, there's a lot of variability in these measurements. Uh, because of differences in the in the natures of the gases, there's also differences in the uh, quality of the measurements. Uh, typically, these measurements are made in, in closed chambers that float on the lagoon for lagoons, and uh, in closed chambers over uh, uh, feedlots and such for uh, uh, open sources and feedlots. It, those are particularly good for measurements of methane because that's bubbling up into the chamber and essentially it's, it's measuring the biogas production of the lagoon. Uh, but it will underestimate the CO2 and the nitrous oxide emissions because the airspace within the chamber will equilibrate with the water and you won't be emitting it uh, as the air would be taking away the gases from the surface of the water. Uh, when we look at the uh, micrometeorological methods are sort of open air measure measurements. Uh, typically those measurements are not going to have the limitations of being only able to deal with bubbled gases um, and not diffused gases, but 
we'll be able to measure all the gases coming off the surface. Uh, one problem with that is that frequently those measurements will have to assume homogeneous distributions of the gases coming off the surfaces, which aren't necessarily true. Uh, the other problem with the micrometeorological or open air me measurements uh, is that water tends to, uh, the weather tends to affect things, both the conditions of the uh, manure as well as the atmospheric removal of those gases from the surface as they come up to the surface. So if we look now at the CO2 and uh, methane lagoon emissions, uh, both those gases are produced by anaerobic decomposition, uh, but again, only the methane is being emitted or is being included within the rule and uh, the proposed rule. And those emissions are going to be influenced by the temperature of the lagoon liquid, uh, or possibly sometimes it's reported in terms of air temperature because they didn't have lagoon temperatures. Uh, it's influenced by wind speed, by the rate at which the gas is removed from the surface as it's come up through the liquid to the surface air, and also in terms of the volatile solids content of the uh, lagoon sludge. If we look at uh, several studies in the literature uh, and look at the methane production from swine finishing operations as well as the uh, sow operations and, and dairy operations, we find that there's actually very little data. Uh, you can see a number of, uh, there's four different studies that uh, have given estimates of uh, methane production per head per year uh, from various places, from Taiwan through uh, the US. And uh, we only have one study for uh, swine sow operation. And we have only one study that uh, I could find that uh, gave enough for the dairy industry uh, lagoons. That being the, 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 the case, and that's the case for many of the emissions uh, of gases from uh, lagoons, uh, I was part of, or still am a part of, the National Air Emissions Measurement Study, uh, which is measuring the gases coming off lagoons uh, of methane as well as uh, hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. And the methane emissions I'm going to describe here and how we're measuring the, the emissions. Uh, we are sampling, you can see, uh, not actually with a open path instrument, but with a series of orifices or inlets that stretch along the side of the lagoon. So we have 10 inlets drawing air in along the edge of the lagoon, and those 10 inlets then combine the air uniformly so that we have an equal sample from each inlet, combine the air into the gas sampling system, which then distributes uh, that air into analyzers. And uh, for the methane measurements, as Frank uh, had described, we're using the photoacoustic spectroscopy method, uh, actually an INOVA 1412. Uh, because of the cost of that instrument, we, we are rotating our instrument between this group of farms here, dairies and swine operations, uh, and so we're not getting an annual basis of measurements, but we're sort of getting snapshots of the measurements at various locations. Uh, those gas measurements <clears throat> are then related to the wind to come up with estimates of the emissions from the lagoons. Uh, to give you an idea of so this snapshot that we have for four different locations, uh, I give you the, uh, the uh, standard deviation of concentrations at a given hour of the day. So 0.5 right here is, is uh, uh, noon in terms of uh, Greenwich time. And the variation of concentration you can see for this dairy in Washington uh, averages something in the order of four parts per million. And we can look at the same thing for sow operations in North Carolina and Oklahoma, or a finisher operation in North Carolina. And if you compare the concentrations and the uh, wind speeds, you can see that the emission, for instance, from this dairy is at least uh, about 10 times greater than the emissions from, say, the sow operation in Oklahoma. That sow operation is probably about 
twice as strong in its emissions of a methane as, say, the sow operation in North Carolina, partly as a result of the operations of the farms, partially as a result of the number of animals involved, and partially climate. Looking at uh, CO2 emissions from lagoons, uh, actually there's very little data out there. Um, we find that uh, the few studies that have been out there are only based on uh, uh, closed chambers sitting on the lagoon water or the lagoon liquid and consequently are all going to be underestimating the emissions. So you see a, a lower arrow, a down arrow here indicates that the estimate should be low. Again, these, scat, these emissions are not covered under the uh, proposed EPA ruling. Uh, we did a study in this past year uh, as a short-term look at a dairy in Indiana here between September and January, um, again, measuring the gases coming in using our synthetic open path or a line sampling system here and analyzing the gas back uh, through our gas sampling system and measuring the gas uh, using a non-dispersive infrared spectrometer. That's essentially measuring the absorption of uh, the carbon dioxide in the longer wavelengths of, of light. And then again, the emissions were calculated using a statistical uh, wind measurement uh, method. give a quick idea of what we're seeing for, uh, over the course of the day again. Uh, we see that the mean wind uh, during this period of September is constant over the day, whereas the concentration of the gas, uh, the CO2, is significantly higher during the nighttime and dropping off to very little in the, more, in the day. So between, uh, so there's a distinct diurnal effect in September and that diurnal effect is seen quite a bit less so, but still present even into November. So the evaluation of the CO2 emissions would have to take the daytime into consideration, and particularly uh, uh, making sure that we cover the nighttime measurements as well as the daytime. In nitrous oxide emissions from lagoons, uh, the nitrous oxide process requires uh, um, oxygen, for the denitrification and consequently, or the uh, denitrification and consequently, there are a number of uh, processes that seem to be engaged in, in resulting in nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, overall, we know that the nitrous oxide has to be uh, produced in the presence of oxygen in the in, in part part of the processes, and so the interface of some partial pressure of oxygen in the water or in the liquid of the lagoon is critical to the emission of nitrous oxide from the lagoon. That requirement has been uh, the reason many studies have said there are no nitrous oxide emissions from lagoons. But some uh, researchers have noted that, in fact, uh, as you consider wind going across the lagoon, oxygen is being uh, dissolved into the upper layer of this water and so the emission is going to be a function of wind speed, and it's going to be a function also then of the nitrogen uh, actually stored in the lagoon from the emissions or from the manure added to the lagoon. Again, we have several studies, but, but not a lot of studies. Uh, the swine sow operations, we see there's a number of measurements having been made. Uh, the flux gradient method here is a micrometeorological method, so the measurements are more likely to be right than the biogas chamber measurements, so all the biogas chamber measurements are indicated with a, minor, uh, a lower down arrow. But even in the micrometeorological method, because the measurements require high resolution of the instruments, frequently they end up with not significant values in the emissions and consequently uh, indeterminate emissions for the nitrous oxide emissions. So we have three major gases. We have methane, we have CO2, and we have nitrous oxide that are contributing to the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from a given farm. And I summarized here the uh, uh, studies that we just had. We've 
seen before in the previous slides. And we see that uh, only nitrous oxide and methane are included within the rulemaking, so that needs to be considered. Uh, there's an error, error right here. This should say metric tons and not kilograms. We see in general that we're talking about 200 or so, uh, 10 to 200 uh, kilograms of, of CO2 per head per year equivalent for swine finishing operations, something around 100 for dairies, and significantly uh, less certain but possibly lower uh, values for swine sow operations. If we move to the uh, open, pat, uh, open waste storage of solids, uh, I just want to briefly mention that this is an area that is uh, often the emissions are not computed in a way that we can make use of them, and we can't tie them back to a uh, number of head on an annualized basis, and so it makes the measurement, uh, the, uh, the usefulness of the reported emissions uh, limited. We have limited information of farm operations. We have limited emissions, uh, limited characteristics of the manure and the meteorological conditions. And usually these studies are done over fairly short periods of time, so we have no way to build out the uh, uh, actual composting or storage uh, out into a, the course of a year for, for a number of animals. Again, there's various accuracies associated with closed chambers and open chambers that The last step is the land application of the manure, and this is not included again within the uh, proposed reporting. The uh, applications have typically been looked at relative to uh, groundwater effects and not emissions into the air, and consequently they tie usually back into the nitrogen or, or carbon uh, in the manure, but not back to what the production, how many animals were actually producing that manure. And there are, again, studies that don't go over the course of the year and consequently are hard to annualize. So the, uh, the big problem with that area is that we need to be able to annualize these, get annual measurements with well-described soil conditions, manure conditions, and, and uh, atmospheric conditions. And the combination of those various features, essentially there's no available measurements that we can use to get a good handle on what the, what the emissions are from the land applied manure. It can be tied back to an individual animal. So uh, summarizing, uh, for the reportable manure storage greenhouse gas measurements uh, in lagoons and basins, the measurements can easily vary by a factor of 10 for the reportable gases. And there are actually very few dairy measurements of lagoon emissions. For the solid storage and compost emissions that I presented uh, very briefly, there are very few useful measurements, and the measurements need to be cumulative so we can look at the course of the entire year. For the non-reportable greenhouse gas measurements, uh, CO2, there's very few measurements made. Those measurements have been made in the bio, uh, as biogas emissions into closed chambers and hence are probably low. And the land application emissions that we just talked about uh, are limited because we don't have a good handle on their, uh, the cumulative emissions over the course of the year. And there's very few measurements that can be re referenced back to the actual uh, manure production. Thank you. Thank you there, uh, Rich. That uh, concludes our presentations. We have a number of people uh, signed on watching this webcast, so I'd encourage those folks to get your messages in, your uh, questions in.